Let's begin with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are very thankful for this morning, uh, for this new week, and an opportunity to continue these studies on the lines. We invite your spirit to guide and direct us as we look at the scriptures, as we try to understand the truths of your word. I pray that you can be with each person. You know the struggles that we have um, living in this world of sin and the burden that you have given us uh, to proclaim your truth. We just ask that you can give us the strength as well and the insight and understanding on dealing with others. Be with us now in this study. Guide and direct us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning, everyone. Now, in this study um, that we've been doing on the lines, it's been, um, and we're going to go to those lines here in, in a minute, but looking at the scriptures, the next thing that we have after a reform line is what? So you have a reform line, and what are you going to have after the reform line? Four generations. Okay, yeah. Well, first you're going to have a falling away, right? So you are going to have the four generations, but you're going to have the first generation, right, before you have the four. So you're going to have the first one. So we know that the number seven is associated with um the reform line so the number seven is uh in genesis chapter one it, it counts the first days of creation the first six days and then genesis chapter two verse one is the seventh day so you have the seventh day made um and god is rested so he created adam and eve on the sixth day and then you have this uh um recapitulation so you're going to have the creation of man and woman. Now, some people read this as if there's like two different creation stories put together. But this repeat and enlarge is a really common Hebrew way of telling a story. So they give that first outline of the first six days of creation. They have the creation of, of man on the sixth day. And then they talk about the rest, the Sabbath rest. And then they go back and they review the creation of Adam and Eve. So, um, and it's going to give us some information, which uh, I don't know if I really want to go into, because we did go through some of this in our study on the sanctuary from Eden lost to Eden restored. But uh, these details, the creation of Adam and Eve it's on the sixth day. So if we were going to put that into the reform line, um, we had that is which way mark? Second angel in part. Yeah, so it's the empowerment of the second angel. Now, of course, that's the creation of animals and man that occur um, on that day. So if I go back to this chart here, you can see the Sabbath is the third angel arrives. So the empowerment of the second angel is the creation of, of man. So we would mark that as the midnight cry way mark. Would that be correct? Yes. Okay. Now, when we parallel this with the, the cosmic line, uh, this is going to be that way mark that is, is our history, that is the Sunday law history. So how would we take the creation of man and connect it to the Sunday law? How are these similar? So what is the Sunday law in response to? The 
the spurious Sabbath. Okay, it's the spurious Sabbath, but it's in response to what? What is also happening as the Sunday law is forming? Because it's going to be a test. So they have a false god or... Um, Okay, is Christ's character being recreated in his people? Yes. Okay. So we can see that that the creation of man and the recreation of the image of God in man are applying to our history. So remember, we're 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 looking at the cosmic line and we're saying that everything that exists in our line is is paralleled by the creation that occurs on the sixth day. It's the sixth way mark. So it doesn't just include the Sunday law, it includes everything in our history. That's the empowerment of the second angel, which is Revelation 18. So that's our history, the history of Revelation 18. Is is that seem consistent with what we're understanding as we zoom into these different lines? Seems to be. Yeah. Okay. So then we can see, you know, this creation model that which is all of this, all of this first line is this first way mark in the cosmic line, right? So everything here on the top line is all of this, right? this creation of heaven and earth and everything um, that here in this Sunday law one, that's our history. That's our line. So that's what we've sort of determined so far. We have our line represents number six creation represents number one on the cosmic line. And, and so as we go through, we're going to have to address each of these seven and we sort of touched on this last one because it's creation of the heaven and earth. But to show how that is a reform line, we haven't really done. Um, and then, of course, we're, we're familiar with the cross, um, trying to understand literal Israel and how the different um, way marks of literal Israel fit into this one way mark called literal Israel. That's going to be interesting. And then we have the flood itself, which we're taking as a way mark. Uh, and that's um, that we're lining up with the creation of the sky. So trying to understand that there, there may be things that we, we decide differently as we go through this. But this is at least how we tentatively have looked at the cosmic line. And that all of this is addressing sin. So now what we want to look at is we're going to look at what happens in a reform line after a reform line. That is, in when you have a reform line, you're going to have um, a falling away that occurs. And, it's, it's, and that falling away is going to begin in the first generation, and there's a progressive destruction of four. So... We, we know that when we look at um, the creation of man and woman here, that this is an ex expounding upon the second way mark. So I don't want to jump ahead too much. I don't know how much we should address this, but since this is the creation of man and women, man and woman, and this is the Sunday law. So what is it about the man and woman? We studied this before, so I'm just kind of reviewing it. What does the man represent? It. And the woman? Church. Right. So this is church and state. So we can see in the, in the Sunday law is a perversion of the original creation. That is, God created man and woman to have a relationship where man is um, the ruler. He's the one, dominion is given to Adam. But it's a relationship of love. So the woman is not in control of the relationship, which is what happens when you have the mixture of church and state. 
So it's a perversion of God's original order. So we can see here how the creation of Adam and Eve is, is connected to the Sunday law. And um, now the other thing that happens here that, that I, I don't have an answer to, but it talks about these rivers. Um, so you're going to have these rivers that water the garden. And, and I've had ideas about this before, but you're going to have Pison, uh, Gihon, Hittichel, and, um, uh, and the fourth is Euphrates. Now, of course, this is before the flood. You know, and trying to understand, you know, how these relate to the world before the flood and the world after the flood. I'm not sure uh, what that means. Uh, but these are the names that are given. But what are these four rivers? Why are there four rivers? And why are they being referenced here in, with the Garden of Eden? Does anybody have any ideas of what this means? Nobody with ideas? When you look at the meaning of each name, name of the rivers. Yeah, and, and, and the, the meaning of the name might say something for that. I mean, the earth would have changed so much after the flood. It's kind of weird to talk about these rivers and even, you know, talking about Hittichel, that is, which goes toward east of Assyria, right? So the Hittichel is the Tigris, right? That, that's what river would be referred to. Um, and then the fourth is Euphrates. But they talk about these rivers. Um, and, and I've always puzzled about this. So I, I don't have an answer to it. But there must be some symbolic reason that these are referenced here. And... So it's just I was just thinking perhaps it has something to do with from where they flow and to where they're flowing and what roles those lands play in these last days. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It, 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 I don't well, know either. I have no idea. That's all all I'm trying to say. So it's just it's something that's there and, and I know it's probably important, but I don't know what the answer to it is. And and then in chapter three, you're going to have the fall of Adam and Eve. So, so we have, you know, the creation day, we go back and they reference the creation of Adam and Eve, and now they're going to deal with the fall. So, so the fall happens, of course, after the Sabbath, right? So they don't fall on the Sabbath. And how long it is until the fall occurs, the Bible doesn't tell us. But if we were going to infer symbolically when the fall was going to occur, wouldn't it be after seven years of creation that you should at least have seven years of creation before the fall? Or is that just an assumption? No, I would, I would have to agree that it has to be more than seven years. I've always wondered if it wasn't after a jubilee. Okay, so whether it was seven years or 49 years, um, Jewish tradition has it seven years. So that there are seven years that Adam and Eve live uh, sin-free uh, before the fall. And that's the position I've taken, that it's in the eighth year of creation uh, that the fall occurs. But, um, but you know, none of this could be proven. But we do know that Adam and Eve aren't going to fall right away. And the fact that we have the seven days of creation implies seven years, just as a symbol. But 
you know, because it also represents 7,000 years. The seven days of creation represents 7,000 years. But a day for a year, it seems reasonable that there's at least going to be seven years that Adam and Eve do not sin. I, I wouldn't see any evidence that it's a jubilee, um, but we don't know. These are just guesses. You couldn't prove it one way or the other. The only thing that I have is in my chronology is that if I count um, from 1844, if I count um, 120 uh, or six, what is it? Yeah, 120 times 49, which is a Jubilee cycle, I get 5,880 years. And if I take that off of 1844, um, you know, it's going to bring me to to 4037 uh, BC. And so it, it would end up being, um, I'm trying to remember how I did this. Am I doing that right? Something I'm not doing right, but anyway. There's some way in which I figured that out, which I don't remember right now. It's not that important. So let's go back to the fall here um, of Adam and Eve in chapter three. So you're going to have this falling away. This is, is part of the reform line. And we all know the story of the fall and we know of the gospel promise. And that is the seed of the woman. I'll put enmity between thee and the woman between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, this is the beginning of the falling away, but it's also the proclamation of the everlasting gospel. So if we're going to put this in a... Um, can we say that since the creation, since the seventh day, when God rests, that they're going to be under the proclamation of the third for a period of time. I don't know how to say this. Um, you may have a hard time visualizing this, so I'm just going to go back to this chart. Okay, so we're dealing with this first way mark this this or this first way mark so this history here we're ending with the sabbath but the question is just like our, any reform line when the third angel arrives you're under the proclamation of the third for a period of time and are you under the proclamation of the third during the the progressive destruction of four Because we know since October 22nd, 1844, we've been under the proclamation of the third angel's message, according to the spirit of prophecy. So are they going to be under the proclamation of the third up until the next way mark? Or when does the proclamation of the third end? Did you understand what I'm saying? Because the third is this Sabbath. Adam and Eve had a, a death uh, decree, or uh, maybe that's the end of the third. Okay, well, so, but I would say that it has to continue. That is under, that each way mark is continued that you're under the proclamation of a way mark, even during the period of the progressive destruction of four. At least that's the way it is in our line. So we know that we're under the proclamation of the third, then you have a progressive destruction of four. So when we look at spiritual Israel here in the cosmic line, this is Millerite history. And 
it's it's the symbolization of the formalization of the second angel's message because Babylon's going to fall in this history and Babylon's going to fall in this history all right so this is about the history of Babylon um in a spiritual sense so so at an October 22nd, 1844. So if you go to this waymark below here, which is just imagine this is the Millerite line, which is this one. This is our line. But at the October 22nd, 1844, you have this close of probation. And then the third the third angel arrives October 22nd, 1844. But it's going to continue and it's going to be joined by the angel of Revelation 18, which is our history. So Millerite history and our history are connected with this proclamation of the third angel's message. But the question is, we know that the third angel's message is never empowered in any reform line. That is, if we go to each of these reform lines, the third angel arrives, but it's never empowered. You have a reform line. You have a falling away. It's followed by a falling away. And then a progressive destruction of four. Then a period of darkness in the fourth generation. And then you have another reform line. And that reform line is a repeat of the first and second angels' messages, in a sense, um, that happened at the beginning. But it's going to respond differently because it's a different period of darkness. And then it's going to result in a third angel arriving. But that third angel is not going to be empowered because there's going to be a falling away. And so in each of these reform lines, in each way mark, when we zoom in and we see a reform line on that way mark, we have a third angel's message arriving. But it's never empowered until the very end. That is, the final way mark on the cosmic line will finally restore what was given at the beginning. So in the first reform line, the reform line of creation, you have the Sabbath. God says that it's very good. And that's not going to be true again until there's a new heaven and a new earth. So you're going to have the, the thousand years and then the new heaven and the new earth. So that final way mark on the cosmic line is a repeat of the Sabbath. It's God finally closing up and restoring everything to the way it was, closing up Earth's history and restoring everything back to the original creation. So the, the point is we have a third angel's message. And the question that I have about that is then in <coughs> this history on the cosmic line, we have to agree that the, the message that arrives is the message of creation but also the proclamation of the gospel after the origin of sin is also part of that first angel's message Do people understand what i'm trying to say here anybody not understand what i'm trying to say you said creation of heaven and earth is the first angel you said well so this story of creation we have the story of creation which we have as a reform line. And that is, we're saying that this is the reform line. It ends with the Sabbath. And then we have a falling away, and that falling away is going to be the origin of sin. And when we have the falling away, Adam and Eve sin, there's going to be the proclamation of the everlasting gospel. And the question is, what is that proclamation of the everlasting gospel? Is it part of this reform line? That is, is it part of the third angel's message? Do you, you understand what I'm what I'm asking? Yeah, you're trying to see what the end of the reform is. Yeah, so we have the third angel's message arriving, and we're saying that's the Sabbath. Here's an, the other way to look at it. With Seventh-day Adventism, the third angel arrives on October 22nd, 1844. Is the third angel's message understood on October 22nd, 1844? Not at all. No, they don't even know about the Sabbath yet, right? They're not keeping the Sabbath. 
They don't know about the issues of the great controversy, yet we say the third angel arrives on that date. So that third angel is also going to have to have a development of that message. So when the Sabbath arrives at the end of creation, and then Adam and Eve sin, and then they're given this gospel promise, can we say that Genesis 3.15 is the third angel's message? That it's part of that first reform line. Because God gives Adam and Eve the Sabbath and they fall away. Right? Because only a holy person can keep the Sabbath holy. So even though they're given the Sabbath, they're not yet holy. And, they're, and they, they demonstrate that when they fall away. And so then God gives this gospel promise. And, and the question is, we know that this is the everlasting gospel, is it not? I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Is this the everlasting gospel? Yes. Okay, because this is the first gospel promise. It's the everlasting gospel. It's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And, and its proclamation is then what we see when we go through this history of Genesis, all the way up to the flood, and actually all through Scripture. Remember, we talk about this thread of the seed of the woman. And in our history, we talked about the fact that um, Christ's character is going to be perfectly reproduced in his people, and then shall he come to claim them as his own. So this, the promised seed, Christ, is also tied to the woman. You know, because Christ needs to be born in us. The woman is the church, and the seed is Christ. I can see, I can see that. So Christ comes from the woman which is the church. You know, it's not just about Eve, right? This is about the woman, the church. The church has to reproduce the character of Christ. Now, Christ came and he died and he did bruise the serpent's head and the serpent bruised his heel. But that work is not yet completed. So this is the thing about Adventism is we recognize that a work that Jesus did upon the cross has to be worked out in his people. That is, we have to take up our cross, that there is a final generation that shows that what Jesus accomplished at the cross is real. And then this earth's history can be closed up. So this gospel, that's pro proclaimed in Genesis 3.15 is still part of that third angel's message. And it's the Sabbath. So the Sabbath of creation is tied up with the third angel's message because it's going to, and it's going to be uh, dealt with at the Sunday law, but it's finally going to be empowered when sin has been dealt with. So Adam and Eve sinning is a falling away. But even in spite of the time you have a falling away, you have the proclamation of the everlasting gospel. Yeah, with the, with the uh, killing of the lamb, foundation of the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so... So, you know, when we studied the sanctuary, we're going to see all these types are now going to be set up. You know, they're going to find out they're naked. They, they clothe themselves with, with uh, fig leaves. And then uh, God is going to provide a lamb that's going to be slain. And they're going to be clothed with, with skins, right? 
So pointing forward to Christ's righteousness, the substitute that needs to occur. Um, and then we're going to have, uh, you know, Cain and Abel. Now, Cain and Abel, is this the second generation? I would say yes. Okay, so Adam and Eve are the first generation. Yeah. And the second generation is Cain and Abel. So what's being symbolized, or what do Cain and Abel symbolize that we would line up with the second generation? Because now we're dealing with the progressive destruction of four. So we can see that the first generation has a falling away, but also under the first generation, there is a proclamation of the gospel that happened in Millerite history. And we're going to see this as we start to go through these different histories. But there's a proclamation of a message. Now, Cain and Abel are the second generation. And how does what Cain and Abel experience typify the second generation? What, what is it that they're symbolizing? Well, there was a murder. Okay, so there's a murder. Yeah. Then there was a uh, disagreement on... What God, what God wants. So there's about worship. Yeah, right? okay. or, yeah, about worship. So we can see worship. We can see sin being manifest in murder. So, so we know that there's sin. That this line here, this progressive destruction of four, is about sin, because we're going to finally get to the point where the thoughts of their heart is only evil continually, right? That's why there's going to be a flood. That would be the fourth. Yeah, that's the fourth. You're correct. So, so we got the second here. This is going to be Cain and Abel. And I mean, we're very familiar with this, um, this story. And, and one of the things that's going to happen with Cain is going to be this curse, right? The seven times. Genesis 4, uh, no, it's Lamech. Uh, where's Where's the curse of Cain? Um, yeah, 415. The Lord said unto him, therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. So what is this mark of Cain? I'm looking at 1 John 3, 12 there. I put it in the chat. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. Okay. So there's a clear cleavage between the righteous and, and the wicked there. And also the preceding verse says, for this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Well, if God is love, exemplified then the children of the wicked one only exemplify hatred so it's there again you know they're they are polarized yeah th there's definitely two classes here as well so yeah that's what i'm saying yeah the, t the two classes so two classes are developing now the thing about a progressive destruction of four and a reform line What's the difference or is or what's the similarity between a progressive destruction of four and a reform line? I know this is a topic that everybody's really familiar with, but when we look at our history, 
we know that Millerite history and our history are connected. And they're connected because we're going to have um, a, a repeat of Millerite history. And, and we're going to see that this repeat of history is, is a common um, uh, feature in a reform line, that it is a repeat of history, which we should understand because all reform lines are telling us the same thing. But also between these is a progressive destruction of four. In our history, it's four generations. And I mark them from 1844 to 1888, 1888 to 1919, 1919 to 1957. And 1957 marks the beginning of the fourth generation in which the last reform line occurs. And that begins in 1989. So when we look at a reform line, um, it's characterized, characterized by three. And then in the first generation, there is also a fourth. And, and that's what I want to try to sort out. Here, I'm going to go to the whiteboard and try to illustrate this. Because here's, here's the problem I'm having, I guess. So. <clears throat> um. Can you hear me well? You're coming through okay. okay yes. Because I'm using the mic on my camera right now. I, I switched it. So and if I don't sound good when I sit down, remind me to switch it back. So you have a reform line. Um, and, and the one I'm going to use here, well, This, let's say this is the decree. So let's say this is Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes. And then of course you're gonna have, we just call it Nehemiah, just for short. But this is Artaxerxes' second decree. And we can see that this is a reform line that begins the 2300 days. And then this is the fourth. But this isn't really the fourth, that is, when we look at Millerite history, if we can compare them, and we look at this fourth, this fourth I put as 1863. Why do I do that? No, 1862 is an objection. Rejection. Okay, but is it a building? So, so this is the part of the problem I'm having because this is the building of the streets and walls, right? Yeah, okay, a building. Right. Okay, and this is the rebuilding of Jericho. Agreed. Yeah, I can see that. Okay, and this happens in the first generation. But that's the first generation of Adventism. Right. So we're, where you're dealing with one, two, and three, coming up to the fourth, is that not Millerite? Yeah, this is Millerite history here. So this is the arrival of the third angel, October 22nd, 1844. And then you're going to have a repeat of history. That is, in here, you do have a reform line. Correct? That is, we recognize that the fourth is a reform line. So Jeff would write it like this. One, two, three, right? Oops. It's very badly drawn. Okay, does that make sense? Because the fourth is always going to be the second. 
and this Please would continue. And this would be the case here. You would also have a one, two, and a three. Oops. That is, there is a reform line in the story of Nehemiah. You know, here he's going to leave because um, he's the cupbearer there for the king of Persia. So he's going to leave Persia, uh, come to, to Jerusalem. He's going to be involved in building of the streets and walls. And then there's going to be this uh, message here dealing with the Sabbath. Correct? That's the story of Nehemiah? Yeah, I can see that now. Okay. So what we had done is... What Jeff had done is he had taken the reform line of the Millerites and he had ignored this history, or I shouldn't say he ignored it. He knew that this was the fourth, but he tried to parallel this because this is the first generation. And, and in this, this history, you're going to have uh, this way. You're going to have Persia uh, uh, and then Rome. Um, and, oh, pardon me, Greece. So I, I got to put Greece in here. This is Persia. This is Greece. And then you're going to have Rome. And then you're going to have um, the history of Christ. So you're going to have a reform line that occurs here. Uh, and I, I got to deal with that a bit more. Uh, but but the point is, um, this is Persia, Greece, and Rome. So what would the fourth be? Is Rome the fourth? I'm not, I'm not doing this very well. We get paper wrong. Okay, so. Uh, this to me is Zechariah. So you're going to have Persia. So I guess I'll do it up here, Persia. So this is the history of Persia. And then you're going to have Greece. And then you're going to have Rome. Now, Rome is going to have two parts. It's going to have a pagan and a papal phase. Um, but this is Rome. So this is all just Rome. Now, Christ is going to come in the time of Rome, right? But is Rome the fourth? Is that the fourth generation? It's a papal Rome. Okay. So you said it. So, you said it. Oh, wrong, right? Babylon is here, right? Yeah, right. So Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, and Rome. Oh, that's what I forgot. Medo Persia. Well, this is Persia, I guess. Um, I, I can't remember what I did before. But anyway, I'm going to leave it at that. So we have Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, and Rome. But in this history, we're going to end up to this, there's going to be the four generations, and I, I can't remember how I did it before. But anyway, in here, you're going to have a reform line. So this is actually the fourth. So if you go one, two, three, this is actually the fourth. This is just a reform line that happens in the first generation. This is a falling away. That is, this history should have completed and empowered the third angel, but it doesn't. And then you're going to have a progressive destruction of four that leads to another reform line occurring. So in our history, you're going to have the same thing. You're going to have a reform line. You have the first generation, and then you're going to have leading up to finally our history. So that's going to be Revelation 18. Okay. I know I'm not doing it very well because there's something I'm forgetting about, but I can't remember what it is. But, but can we see this part here that after the reform line of the Adventists or at the Millerites, you have the reform line of the Adventists. 
And this is the establishment of the church and that this parallel parallels the history of Nehemiah. Yeah, I can see that. Okay. So, so these, we have to work out, we have to work out some details. So that's the main, the main idea there, I guess, is that we have some problems we have to sort through and where we're going to try to solve these is in studying this, all these other reform lines. <clears throat> now, the first time we have a building is in Genesis chapter four. And, and so this is the question that I have that I haven't resolved because I said, this is the first generation. But if this is the reform line of Adam and Eve, wouldn't the first generation be Cain's generation? And would this be more consistent with what we see? Because he's going to build a city. Right? He's going to name the city after his son Enoch. And so wouldn't we take this building of a city as a parallel? to the building of Jer rebuilding of Jericho and the building of the streets and walls. And so shouldn't we put Cain and Abel as the first generation? Adam and Eve yeah. are falling away, but it's really under Cain and Abel that we see this because Adam and Eve are part of that first reform line. Can I get some feedback to see that people are following what I'm saying? Can did you say, say did you say Cain and Abel were uh, second generation? Well, that's what I said first, right? But when I look at them, you know, I just said you normally just think of them as the second generation, Adam and Eve being the first. But Adam and Eve's reform line, they're part of the first reform line. Right? If if you're gonna say Adam and Eve are paralleling something, they're par paralleling Millerite history. And the first generation of Adventism isn't doesn't include Millerite history. Because it happens after October 22nd, 1844. So then we would say that Cain and Abel are the first generation. Because literally they're the second generation, you know, if you count Adam and Eve as the first. But I'm arguing that they're the first generation after a reform line. That's possible. Do people understand what I'm yeah, trying it, it makes sense to me because I mean, Adam and Eve, I mean, God just zap and they're there, right? But but the rest of them came came by sex, so yeah. But so it, it's a generation, but it human has to, generation. Yeah, but but to me, it has to do with the fact of where they are in the reform lines, because literally, Cain and Abel are the second generation. Adam and Eve are generated; they're created by God. So that's really technically yeah. the first generation yeah. of human beings, right? But as far as it, a reform line is concerned. Cain and Abel would be the first generation, and they have the characteristics. Now, Adam and Eve have a falling away as well. And the way that I always understood it before is their falling away would parallel the falling away that happens after a reform line. But if we understand that the everlasting gospel that is given to Adam and Eve, it's given to them after they sin, and that somehow we have to look at Genesis chapter one, two, and three as all being a part of that re first reform line. Th that first way mark on the cosmic. I, I know I'm not doing a good job at this because, you know, we're just, we're developing this idea right almost from scratch, but let's look at this again. If I'm going to take this line, this creation, I would have to include chapter one, two, and three. And, and maybe we could look at it this way. 
um, this is the creation. And, and this exists as the first way mark within the three way marks that exist within this way mark. That is, in every way mark, there's a three step testing prophetic message. Right? Yes. There's three steps. Now, it, we looked at this way mark itself as the first, second, and third angel's message. But can we see that all of this can be compressed into one way mark within the creation of the heaven and earth? That Adam and Eve's sin, so Adam and Eve, who are church and state, that they represent uh, what we would call Babylon is fallen. Adam and Eve is the second way mark when they sin. And the third way, Mark, is the giving of the everlasting gospel in Genesis 3. Yeah, I can, uh, it seems like that goes together. Okay. It's, it's. Okay, I, I think you're catching up on to what I'm saying. And, I, and it's just finding a way to say it, um, partly. So, so within a way, Mark, that is, even though this is what we call the first way mark, it, it contains in it um, other way marks. And, and, and the third one, the Sabbath one, is the everlasting gospel. That's the gospel promise, the seed of the woman. And Adam and Eve sinning is Babylon is fallen. So so we can zoom in to each of these way marks and see another way mark and we can zoom out so chapter one two and three of genesis represent the first way mark that we would call the creation of the heaven and earth that has in it a reform line that is marked as one two and three and then the fourth generation or the fourth way mark is Cain and Abel. And that's the building, right? So just like we have the streets and walls, or we have the rebuilding of Jericho in the first generation, after a reform line, you're going to have a building or a destruction of a building. Those are also going to occur. And we're going to see this also after the reform line of the flood. In the reform line of the flood, after the flood, whoops, are we going to have a building that occurs? So when we look at the reform line of the flood, which we haven't got to yet, but we will see there's the Tower of Babel. And that's going to be connected to the first generation after the flood. Correct? Tower of Babel was before the flood. No, it's after the flood. Uh -huh. I would say yes. Okay, so, so we're going to see the Tower of Babel, and that's going to parallel in that progressive destruction of four. It's going to parallel Enoch, the city of Enoch, that Cain builds. That in after each reform line, there's going to be either a building or a building and a destruction of a building. The Tower of Babel has both, or sometimes just the destruction of a building after a reform line. But there's always a building involved in the first generation after a reform line. Especially when we look at uh, major reform lines. But remember, when we look at any way mark in a reform line, we can also see a reform line. That is all you're always going to have a first, second, and a third with it with within every way mark. What we're trying to understand right now is how we can zoom in and zoom out so that we always know at what level we're at when we're looking at a reform line. So the other, the building, what, what's that, Chris? So, where would the building of the ark come in? 
Uh, well, the building of an ark is um, part of a reform line. It's not part of a predict, predict, uh, progressive destruction of four. So after a reform line, there is going to be a building. Now, there's a building of the ark, there's a building of temples, and those aren't built, those are part of reform lines. So the building of an ark has to do with the building of a temple. That's what it parallels. It parallels part of a reform line. Because there's also a building that goes on within a reform line, which usually we think of as, as the building of a temple. Does that make sense, Chris? Okay, I'm following. Yeah. So the ark that's being built is not parallel to the building of a city or the building of the Tower of Babel or the rebuilding of Jericho. And then we have to understand about the building of the streets and walls, why that's connected to a falling away of a first generation, which we will see when we get to that reform line. But also it's not a major reform line, even though it, it kind of is in some ways, but we'll see how that fits in. So now between these two reform, line, reform lines, between the creation of the heaven and earth, which is gonna end with the arrival of the third angel's message, which is Genesis 3.15, you're then gonna have in that first generation, Cain and Abel, you're gonna have um, a falling away, which would be Cain killing Abel. And also you're going to have this building of the city, which is named Enoch after Cain's son, Enoch. And, and that's the first generation, the progressive destruction of four. Now, we obviously know there's more than four generations uh, because including Adam and Eve to the flood, there's 11 generations. So, I mean, you would have technically 10 more generations after Adam and Eve until the flood, which Cain and Abel are the first generation. But symbolically, there's going to be a progressive falling away what I call a progressive destruction of four uh, that leads to the flood. That is, you finally get to the point of the fourth generation, that final generation of the flood. And now, technically, how many generations are there, though, when Noah is born? How many generations are alive? Uh, Stephen, um, do you have that in your head offhand? Eight. Okay, so, um, so eight generations are already born. How many from the beginning are still alive? No, 10 have been born because Noah is the 10th. There okay. are eight What's that are still ten? alive because yes. Adam has passed and, and Shem has passed. Okay, so there's eight still alive. I guess, what am I trying to ask? Um, So Noah is the beginning of the tenth generation. You're saying, because he's because according his son, to the Bible, yes, because yeah, his sons are the eleventh. So he would be the ninth generation since the first reform line, right? If we're calling Cain and Abel the first generation, then Noah would be the ninth. Okay. Why Why would Cain and Abel be the first generation? when it's Adam that was descent that was made by God. Yeah, Adam's the first generation literally, but I'm talking about in the progressive destruction of four. Okay. So after the reform line, Cain and Abel are, they represent the first generation. And, and generation isn't necessarily the right word because it's, it's the first of four. That is, it's progressive falling away or progressive destruction that occurs. Right. So we call it four generations. But for instance, when you're dealing with it from the time of Christ to 1798, it's the four churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, and Thyatira. Right. So that's the progressive destruction of four. It's obviously not four literal generations. But there is, so when I'm using the, so that's what I'm trying to say is we can't look at the literal generations to try to determine uh, the four generations. 
because it's not about really generations. It's just the word that we use. Um, well, in, in all the acts, then, the acts, actions. Okay, two different people said something. So, Stephen, what did you say about Enoch? Yes, he he had already been taken by God, so there would have been seven generations left. Okay, so Stephen's right. Okay, so he would have been taken by God. Now, uh, and Enoch is uh, the seventh from Adam. So yes. Yeah, so so there's no way that we can fit in four generations is, is basically what I'm trying to say. We can't be talking about the generations themselves. When we talk about four generations, we have to be finding something else that's marking four different periods. That is, we have the period of Cain and Abel. So what would be the next major period when we're going through the Bible? What would be the change that has happened. What what could would we mark use to mark the four generations? Because they can't be the birth of people; they have to be events. In, in some way, they almost seem like spiritual generations or spiritual variances. Yes, a change occurs, right, of some sort. So that's what I mean by a generation. So that it's a long way to go about it. Now we do have Lamech. Does Lamech mark a change? I mean, you're going to have Cain mentioned, right, some of his descendants, and then finally you get another story in connection with Lamech. And it's also going to be uh, dealing with the seven times, you know, the King James, it says sevenfold. Um, and this one's going to have the 70 and seven, right? 70 and seven times, this curse. Can we can we say that this is the next generation? It's not a literal generation. But it's a progression of rebellion. That's probably a better way of saying it. Progression of rebellion. Yeah, it's just that we always use it the term four generations, right? So yeah, we're accustomed to using four gen. <laughs> okay. Well for for uh, And then you're going to have Adam's descendants to Noah, right? So you're going to have these mentioned. And, and then it's going to talk about the increasing corruption on the earth in Genesis chapter 6. So we have, and it came to pass when men began to multiply in the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all whom which they chose. Now, would this be the third generation? So if we have Cain as being the first, Lamech as being the second, that is a change that occurs. Would we take this, the sons of God, seeing the daughters of men, that they were fair, and taking them wise of all which they chose. Ellen White says this is one of the sins that was the most grievous because it defaced the image of God in man. And we know this is not amalgamation of man with beast. And we also know that this is not angels that is referred to as the son of God, sons of God, that this is the descendants of Adam. Seems, seems to line up at this point. Okay. And then we would have the fourth generation and God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And that's when it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air for it repenteth me that I've made them. Now it could be, that this is still all part of the third generation and that the fourth generation 
would be later. And that's where we have to decide about the reform line of Noah. So, so, so I, I, I'm puzzled over whether I want to include all this section from Genesis 1 to Genesis, Genesis 8 as part of the third generation. Now, Noah, he is going to be born, right? And, you know, before all this or during all of this, and he's going to be given a message. And his message is a time prophecy. And that time prophecy is going to be filled, fulfilled in the fourth generation. Because that's going to mark the start of a reform line. So that means the fourth generation already has to exist uh, when that time prophecy is fulfilled. Because the reform line begins. So I don't know how we how we mark this. Do we mark the fourth generation when the time prophecy is given. That is, when we look at the churches, uh, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, and Thyatira, Thyatira is a period of 1260 years. And that's the fourth generation. That's Jezebel, right? It's the progressive destruction of four, it's the fourth. So could we say that the, the beginning of this 120 years is marking that period that would parallel uh, Thyatira as a symbol? share my screen here so properly right so you got noah and the flood this is going to be um that god is going to give him this uh time prophecy and that is given okay you got noah uh, i don't think it's here i think it's here uh, where does it say his days are going to be 120 years? Here it is. Genesis 6, 3. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is also flesh, yet his day shall be 120 years. And so when it talks here, um, the question is, so this is going to be, you're going to be mentioning the, uh, the sons of God seeing the daughter of man. And then you're going to mention the wickedness of man was great in the earth. So how are we going to sort through this? I, I know this is um, this is all new. It doesn't mean that we have to be correct. We just need to. I didn't switch my camera back. Okay, let's see what we're looking at. Let's try to sort through this. So you're going to have four generations. This is going to be 120 years. This is going to be the flood. You're still sharing. Oh, sorry. So we're going to put Cain and Abel here. This is just tentative, right? Now, when it mentions the 120 years, it mentions it in connection with the thoughts of their hearts were only evil continually.
And this means that the sons of God and the daughters of men had to have preceded this generation. I guess I could have put it up here. Does this make sense to people or am I forcing things? Which that is also the generation of Noah. Yeah. Yeah. So Noah is going to be in this generation, but it's remember, it's not about generations. It's just about the progressive the progression of evil and, and how would we characterize cain and abel this is a type of rebellion right so you have a progressive rebellion that is occurring you first see it in cain you see this manifest in this sort of mocking that lamech does then you see the sons of god marrying the daughters of men and this produces finally this fourth generation, we will call it. it. Can be the generation of Noah, but Noah's born in this period of time. But he's the only one that God finds favor with. And he's going to proclaim a message for 120 years. Does this make sense? Anybody have criticisms about this progressive destruction of four? Or should I divide it up differently? Would I put, you know, would I divide it? I mean, I mean, there are different ways to divide it. We still could put Adam and Eve as the first generation and include them with Cain and Abel, but, but we still well, have Abel here because the building. You're marking, you're marking Lamech, uh, first one that had more than one wife. Yeah, and also, the curse. Whoops. Because he has that curse, which is a mocking curse. You know, the 70 times seven curse. Yeah, yeah. Right. And another way you could look at it, I mean, there's the curse of Cain. There is in this generation, well, let's parallel this to Adventist history. Okay, so in the first generation of Adventism, what happens? Seven times rejected. Okay, so the seven times is rejected. So do we have the seven times mentioned here? Yes. Okay. And this brings us to 1888. So don't get confused, right? This is 1844, this is 88. So this is the first generation of Adventism. It's a rejection of the first and second angel's message. And they come to, to reject the third angel's message. So you can see that this is a reform line, but it's a form line of failure, right? Because before this, you have the reform line of creation, Cain and Abel, and, and you have the giving of the gospel to Adam and Eve, but this doesn't benefit Cain. And you have the separation of the two classes that occurs here, but you also have this building. So in Adventism, this is the first generation. So what is the second generation? And why would we say that Lamech would parallel the second generation of Adventism. Uh, 
it possibly because he's adding to um, the original curse or on Cain? Okay. So this is the first generation of Adventism. It, it actually has two groups. We have Cain and Abel, right? So there's, there's a division that happens after a reform line. Now, in this generation, there is a re rejection of this history, not just Millerite history, but a rejection of Adventism. That is, the second generation begins to forget the first generation. So from 1888, once they reject the three angels message, they're going to develop here in this history to come to 1919. Right, and 1919 is going to be the doctrine of Christ, which rejects prophecy, and then it's going to end with questions on doctrine. So can we see, with the sons of God, and the daughters of men, what is this history representing? Church and state. Well, in Advent, on doctrine. what's that? Well, like you just, you, you've got that going right down there, two questions on doctrine. So we're rejecting further God's law. Yeah, and this is the mingling. So the sons of God here would be Seventh-day Adventists mingling with you. Protestants. The Protestants, right? So this is this period in which we want to be Protestants, which aren't really Protestant at all. We want to join apostate Protestantism. And then this is the period of darkness, right? Because men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil so the evil that exists exists in darkness and then you have the reform line but this preaching that occurs here this 120 years is that that period of time that's going to end here with the reform line with the flood so we can see how this would parallel adventist history it's in a progression of iniquity. It's what. Right. It's the progression of iniquity. This is a mocking. It's a lack of respect. Because the curse of Cain, that's something that God put. But this one of Lamech is really a mocker, mocking the fact that he kills someone. He's just mocking this, this idea of this curse, this mark. Okay. So we can see that from 1888 to 1919, this is a further rejection of the truths that were established after 1844 in the first generation. But we can also see even in this history, even though truths are being established, we also have a falling away that's occurring in this history as well. Right, and if you see like Ephesus, a pure church, right, it's represented as a white horse, but yet it still has problems, right? So when you look at, um, and not that Ephesus is, but the first, that first church, because that's two different lines of prophecy. But you can see, if you go through these histories in this progressive destruction of four, you should be able to line them up. And to me, this is the way to do it. I don't know if anybody has any suggestions of what I could be doing wrong. So I'm going to need to draw this out. So we're going to have to maybe I'll put it here. So remember, 
you have in each of these reform lines from the arrival of the first to its empowerment or to its formalization, pardon me, is an increase of knowledge. But you can see that I'm putting this increase of knowledge here in the cosmic reform line. It also occurs during a period of progressive destruction. That is, in order to get to the next way mark, you have to have an entire reform line and the falling away of four in order to have the next reform line. So this, this is the premise that I've been working on and that, that you would see this in each of these major way marks on the cosmic line. That from the time of the flood, you're going to see again a reform line that happens and then a falling away that leads finally to this way mark. But each of these each of these reform lines, whoops, are going to have, or each of these way marks are going to have a reform line. And that we can see in this reform line of the flood, that it doesn't just occur with the flood itself. Because we can look at that flood, but we can see also with the flood that it's going to have events that follow it. And, and, and that's where we're going to run into trouble because we're going to try to say, is this a major reform line or is this just a reform line within one of the way marks? So, so that's what we're going to have to sort out. We're going to have to sort out how we do this. So to me, it seems pretty straightforward between these two way marks that there is a progressive destruction of four and that we will find that that same thing occurs here. But we're also going to notice that there is a parallel line that's happening. That is all through this history in this first angel's message, it's going to be addressing the seed of the woman. And the seed of the woman is going to be literal, right? That is, the, the Bible is going to bring us from the descendants of Adam through Seth and finally through uh, uh, Shem um, and then through uh, um, Jacob and then through David and finally lead us to, to Christ, who's going to be born of the seed of the woman. And that's going to be literal, right? So that seed of the woman is literal, but it's also spiritual. And why do I say it's also spiritual? What did we learn about the seed, what it symbolizes? What's the blessing? What's that? Because this is the argument Paul makes in the book of Hebrews. Somebody said something? Maybe we could read. The seed is Christ. Okay, the seed is Christ. But, but is it always literally the firstborn that receives the promise, the blessing? No. No, so, so often it's not, right? So, so even though it, it is the literal seed, it doesn't necessarily follow that the firstborn, uh, because that's what it should have been, is the firstborn. But even then it's going to be the one that's spiritual, that inherits, in, that becomes the line that leads to Christ. So he is going to be of the literal seed following through uh, the covenantal promises, the one that receives the blessing. But it's not always going to be the firstborn that receives the blessing. But Christ is the firstborn. So, so he's, he's the primary seed. And then he's going to have his seed, which is spiritual Israel. So at the end, 
the final people that represent Christ's character, are spiritual Israel, the ones who actually keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. So in this cosmic line, we have this, this um, split between the first and the second. And we'll start to see that, that even that application from the cosmic line, understanding the difference between the first and the second, because the first offers an opportunity to a group of people, but it's going to be rejected by the majority. The second angel arrives when the first group of people fail their test. And then the second angel is going to be uh, this work in preparing a people to stand. And they stand at the Sunday law. But also, um, this Sunday law way mark has a close of probation. Oops, I just keep doing that, grabbing things. Um, and it, but you can see that close of probations occur in every single one of these way marks. But there is a final close of probation. which is going to happen in connection with the end of the world. So that close of probation, we know there's a close of probation here, but this one would somehow, whether we want to call it a close of probation, but it's a final, the end of sin. So the destruction of the wicked ultimately and of the righteous being with God forever. So, is this is this helpful what we're doing how we're i mean it takes a bit to sort out but you can see that each of these have a progressive destruction of four there's going to be way marks within each of these way marks which are going to be expansions of um you know the arrival of the first the empowerment of the first it's going to have the second angel uh in it so when we go from literal Israel here, from Exodus to the cross, we have a lot of way marks in here and a lot of reform lines. But those reform lines, um, these are just, these, those are just the big lines. We're looking yeah, this at. is the big line. So when we zoom into literal Israel, we're going to see that there is the Exodus itself. There's going to be uh, the period of the judges and how we would look at that. There's going to be David, uh, well, Saul, David, and Solomon. And then there's going to be the dividing of the kingdom. And then there's going to be um, the civil war that happens again. So you have the revolution and then, then the civil war. And then you're going to have the 2520s. And all of these things, they're all part of literal Israel. They're all way, they're all reform lines, but each of those reform lines are also way marks. That is, they're way marks within this way mark. That the arrival of literal Israel is the beginning of a way mark, even though, or, or the beginning of a reform line on two different levels that in and of itself it's a reform line and so just like you can take this and expand it out you can do that with each of these you can zoom in you can find the way mark and you can expand them out the thing is it's hard to keep that in your head right you have to be familiar with each of the way marks on the cosmic line and understand the progressive destruction of four that exists between them, but also recognize that there is reform lines even within those progressive destructions of four. We do one step at a time. Yeah. So that's what we're First, trying to do. Then, then we can work our way to that. Yeah. Yeah. But we're going to find it, it gets a little crowded in some of these. 
that is in some of these waymarks, there's a lot of other reform lines. And for instance, in the story of Esther, I argue that it's, it's actually a reform line within the decrees itself. That is, it's a way mark, which was, is the empowerment of the second angel's message within the reform line of the three decrees. But it in and of itself is a reform line. And it illustrates the entire line. And so, you know, what we saw in Millerite history, so just to kind of go back. So what we saw in Millerite history is we saw that there was this reform line, which we call the first and second angels message, which is the parable of the 10 virgins. That is the going forth of the virgins represented the first angels message and the tarrying time represented the second angels message. But then we saw that there was this other line, Samuel Snow's line, and we didn't know how to address it. But we can see that it's actually zooming into a way mark. And it's, it's the way mark of the arrival of the second angel. In our history, this, this movement is a zooming into a way mark. It's not the big line. That whole way mark on the cosmic line called the empowerment of the second angel's message is a reform line. But our history is even zooming in another level on that reform line, particularly the Sunday law way mark on that reform line. And, and we, we will see how this works. Once we start to get this pattern laid out, we will start to be able to see how we can zoom in and recognize the characteristics of the reform line. So hopefully this will be, we will be able to comprehend it. We'll be able to put it all together, but it's just going to take time. So, so we'll go over this tomorrow. I'll try to draw this up. And so we have a diagram. Somebody had a comment? I was just going to comment and saying, I think this is a worthwhile exercise for many different reasons. Yeah. But one that shows us how God has been working to save man, this whole process. Right. It, it helps us to understand God's restoration of the, of the image of Christ in man. Right. To restore us to that to that image but you can see how we we're moving on through history we can we can mark where we are we know that we're in the sixth way mark of the cosmic line so we know that's where we're at but we often don't understand where we are within that way mark and we need to know where we are because we need to know what our responsibility is what it is that we are supposed to be doing. It's not so much that we can know the future, but it's so that we can know our present duty. How do we relate to the Seventh-day Adventist church, for instance? That's something we have to decide. And I believe the way marks and the lines help us understand that. That's what this movement has been about. So anyway, let's close with prayer. <clears throat> a dear Father in heaven, we thank you again for this study. We know that uh, it's difficult, but we ask that you can help us as we continue to progress through this study this week and, and the weeks to come. We pray for this movement and um, that you can help us in the development of truth. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.